can I please have a massive round of applause for Amir, who's going to speak about pub partitions. Yeah, let's give it for pubs. We love pubs. We like drinking. I'm on my fourth pint. No, not really, not really. Um, it's great being back. This is my third talk. So I've been slightly sort of upstage, but uh, it, it's great to be in a company of an alumni. I've got something to kind of aspire to. Um, so last time I was here, I think sort of pre-lockdown as well, I was reminded, I was talking about coal hole covers and those very decorative, ornate cast iron lids above um, old uh, basements and so on. But today I'm going to talk all about pubs and how pubs used to be very different and the interior was very different from what we know today because pubs used to be segregated. There used to be a very specific designation of areas within pubs based on your social class, based on your gender as well. And to be honest, it's an area of pub history that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, I wasn't aware of. And it will also answer the ancient old question, why do pubs have so many doors, <laughs> but only one of them is in use? Why? That embarrassing moment when you're meeting a friend and you go in and, oh, it's locked, no, no that one, that one, go in, that one, that one. And then you sort of make your way in. So hopefully this uh, talk will clarify this uh, topic. There's a reason for that. So this, sorry, I'm just going back a bit. This is the Jolly Butchers in Stoke Newington. And you can see that even today it has four doors. But back in the day, each one of those doors was in use and it was open, but it led to a very specific part of the pub. Okay, today pubs are very much sort of open plan, but back in the day it was very, very different. You can see it in the photo, so I'm just going to enlarge it a bit. Sorry. All right, there's all these kind of signs above all these doors, uh, and you can see that one of them says private bar, public bar, bottles and jugs, saloon bar. Which one would you go into? <laughs> Looking at this room, I would say definitely not the public bar. Definitely not. Probably the saloon, and maybe some of you, if you wanted a bit of privacy, read a book, bring a woman as well to drink with you, you go to the private bar. Okay? <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> back in the day, there was a very strict social hierarchy in pubs that reflected really the society at the time. This is a very famous sketch from 1966, the class sketch. Uh, go on YouTube, have a look. But it really shows you that the, the interior of the public house uh, for about 100 years really reflects a society and the very clear boundaries between certain classes, working class, middle class, upper middle class, and so on. Today, when you go to a pub, and we all know the feeling, you know, you look inside, oh, it's a bit rough, it's a proper boozer, I'm not going to fit in, I'm going to go to the gastro one with the kind of the leather seats and the kind of the seven pound a pint and so on. But other people, Right? You know, other people will go into that rough pub because that's where they feel at home. That's where they feel comfortable. The interesting thing is that pubs used to accommodate everyone, but you had to go to your place. You had to know your place. You had to go to the section of the pub where your kind congregate and drink. When you go to a pub today, this is one of my favorites in Stoke Newington, um, the Rose and Crown. You go in, you know, it's a nice big space. You think, where are we going to sit? Not by the toilet, it's a bit smelly. There's a fireplace. I want to sit in the corner, it's a nice little kind of cozy area. I'm going to read a book, I'm going to have my Sunday roast and so on. But you've got the option. You know, it's a nice open space. You can, you can decide where you want to go and sit. But if you look at the plan of the Rosen Crown from 1931, right? So the arrow kind of shows you that kind of angle that we had. You can see that the pub was a much more sort of subdivided space, and every space had a name, the saloon bar, the outdoor department, which was effectively the off-license. You, you know, before the days of the supermarket, you would go in with a jug or just buy the bottles. You had the private bar, you had the public bar, and each of them had a separate entrance, okay? And the thing is, if you go to the saloon bar, you don't go to the public bar because you're not that class. Okay? If you do go to the saloon bar and you think, ooh, what's going on in the public bar, you don't want to make that mistake. <laughs> okay? So pubs used to have all these screens creating these divisions between all these spaces. And we're going to see that while they had those physical barriers, they were not kind of like proper walls or partitions. They were much more subtle and decorative, which I think is very interesting. 
these are just some plans of some other pubs and all these plans for about a hundred years you can see that there was always a very clear division between usually the public bar and the saloon bar the counter was usually in the middle either as an island or as a peninsula so the staff could serve everyone but if you were a laborer, if you were in sort of overalls with sort of dusty boots and you just came from the factory, you go to the public bar, you play darts, okay? If you came from the office or you've got a uniform, okay, or you want to treat your girlfriend or wife or drink, you go to the saloon bar. You're not gonna take a date to the public bar. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> this is the wagon and horses and I color coded the different areas because look at that. You've got the saloon bar, you've got the private bar, you've got the off license, you've got the kind of the meals and games, you've got the public bar and you've got the restaurant, right? And all of them were subdivided with all these screens. If you think that this looks like a house, you know, there's like all these areas, that's why it's called a public house. It was effectively a house that has all these rooms, but they were very much designated to specific class and gender. Imagine that today. And you can still see a lot of these ghost doors, right? Um, you know, this is the, the Hackney Dan in Stoke Newton Road. It's got three doors. I mean, the kind of the quality is a bit poor, but all of them now are locked. Some of them are sort of painted over. It's a bit of a hobby. Next time you see a pub, count the doors. Usually there's two to five, but only one of them is in use because all the other ones are no longer leading to, was that the saloon bar? Was this the private bar? And so on. It's really interesting when you look at the evolution of what we call the multi-room pub because pubs started just as someone's house. So someone just sort of, you know, produced beer and they invite people to come to their house and drink beer. If the people that came to your house to drink beer were working class laborers, you would take them to the kitchen. You know, just sit at the table, here's your pint, enjoy. If someone came who was a bit more sort of, I would say superior class, you would say, come to the parlor come to my lounge, watch some you know, Netflix or whatever, right? But you would actually take them to the better room. You won't have them sitting next to the farmers and laborers in all their dusty clothes and their strange accents and so on, right? And you can see how the, that concept of serving drinks in someone's house evolved. And you started storing the drinks in the kitchen. And then you put a little servery and it starts referring to as the, the tap room. And then you put a place for cooking because now the kitchen is just some blokes sitting and having pints, okay? And your missus is asking what the hell is going on, all right? But then, you know, that kitchen becomes the tap room and there's a little bar in the corner where you feel like a man when you're standing there and serving drinks. And you've got the company parlor and you've got the private parlor and different people, different class. You say, oh, go to that room. Better sort of furniture. I've got a carpet. I've got some ferns. There's a fireplace. That's the bathroom for you to go. And you can see that the bar starts to move into the center until the Victorian sort of public house had this, like I said, this island, servery bang in the middle, the staff sort of running around like headless chickens, serving everyone, but they've got all these partitions and they don't see each other. Contentious, I know, <laughs> but interestingly, all those rooms in pubs, they do vary. Um, there's a strong regional sort of difference in the names of those. So if you go on holiday and you see kind of a, if you go up north, you're probably not going to see a saloon bar. It's going to be called a smoke room, right? There's a lot of variations uh, across the regions um, and even in plans. So when you look at those blueprints, you can see the, the differences. It's really interesting because some pubs have retained the signage and the lettering. So next time you go to a pub and there's a big sign saying saloon bar, it used to be the saloon bar. Or if it says public bar or jug bar or saloon and billiards, if you've got sort of ladies bar, ooh, we're going to see that as well. All right, the public bar. And it's really interesting for me when you look at, you know, just the artistry of the lettering and the typography and, you know, whether it's iron or sort of gold sort of letters and so on. A lot of variety, very interesting stuff. Now, the fascinating thing is when you walk to the multi-room pub, on one hand, you wanted to create the division based on class and gender, but you didn't want to make people claustrophobic. You didn't want to make them feel like they're going into this tiny room. You needed to find the balance between cozy and, and really nice, but not kind of too claustrophobic. So you can see that you had all these, usually timber and glass partitions, screens, but this guy, 
is probably in the public bar, and those other people are in the saloon bar, in the same pub, different class. This guy in the public bar pays less for the drinks, okay, sitting on probably just wooden furniture. There are other people just on the other side sitting on nice comfy seats. They've got a fern. That was a big, big thing. They've got the fern, and they're paying a bit more just for that quality. Okay, now, sadly, um, all those remnants of how pubs used to be and how they used to be divided, there are very few of those surviving today. Um, this is from 2004, uh, a great book called License to Sell. Fewer than 4% of existing pub interior retains much historic value. Pubs have been modernized so many times. They've been completely ripped apart, gastrified, kitchens, pizzas, and all that, and that's fine. That's evolutions, okay? Pubs today are nowhere near the coaching inns and taverns and ale houses of 200 years ago. But the reality is that if you're looking for partitions, if you're looking for any remnant of how pubs used to be, you're going to have to look very, very carefully because they, there are not many of them around. Only 39 pubs in London are actually in the National Inventory of Historic Pub Interiors. So people like me, when they go to a pub and they see a partition, they get weirdly excited. <laughs> Okay, when I go and I see one of those saloon bar signs, I take my phone out, I take a photo, and I add it to my collection. <laughs> We're going to look at some screen work. It's a word, okay? What's interesting to me was that those partitions between the classes and genders, it wasn't like today some builder comes and overnight puts some sort of plasterboard and says, okay, this is this room, this is that room. They were decorative, they were ornate. You didn't want to create... The, the feeling that people were in this enclosed space. So you can see that there were a lot of variations, but all of them timber, quite thin, and decorative glass. This is the Mecca of partition pubs. <laughs> this is the Prince Alfred. Yay! Grade two listed. Check it out, okay? Uh, it has five original compartments from 1898. I did a two-hour walk from Hackney. Okay, and when I showed up, I took photos of everything in the pub. The staff got very worried, almost called the police. <laughs> okay, but you can see what I mean, that all these rooms, they're amazing. Look at that, right? And I tell you what, as, a, as an avid pub goer, it's such a different experience to walk into a pub and rather than just be confronted with this, what I think of now is the warehouse, you have all these very cozy, intimate little areas kind of like two tables and a few chairs, and it feels much more cozy. It's a house, it's a public house. Um, but it's interesting when you start kind of collecting and surveying the different styles of these partitions, just to see that most of them didn't go all the way up to the ceiling, because again, you didn't want to create much of a claustrophobic feeling. You're creating a barrier, but the ceiling was the thing that everyone shared. And you can look around, and you can see that you're sharing the space with other people, other classes, other genders, but you're not confined into this little cell, okay? No one wants to drink in prison, not like this. Okay, this is uh, the Jon Snow. These were service doors, uh, doors, so the staff could walk around, collect the glasses. Uh, don't be cheeky and get the cheap drink in the public bar and then go to the saloon bar. <laughs> we don't like that, okay? And you're probably going to get found out very quickly because you don't have the overalls and the, the boots and so on. This is the Windsor Castle. Again, the service door there. You got the glass. So you could, you, you could I mean, technically, you could see people on the side. I mean, it wasn't meant to completely create that division. It was almost symbolic, but it did the trick. This is the King's Arms in Waterloo. But it, it, again, like I said, it's interesting just to see the variety of styles. It wasn't just one manufacturer that just, here's your partition. Okay, you wanted to make it part of the decoration. You wanted to make it fit in. The pub was a place that attracted people because the interior usually was much nicer than their homes, right? So you wanted to keep it that way. This is the king's head. So they kind of retained it, but they obviously now you can walk another side. But very decorative, etched glass timber and so on. This is a bit more kind of like budget partition, <laughs> right? And the angel. Yeah. Um, some pubs uh, kept them, like I said, not many of them. By the 1960s, um, social attitudes towards class and gender changed. The idea that you can tell the working class, you drinking that bit, and the middle class can drink in that section of the pub was no longer acceptable. So they were just ripped out. Um, there were also other reasons for that as far as supervision, licensing. You create privacy, but you also create areas for people to kind of go up for no good and do some immoral um, things as well. 
This is the Canterbury Arms in Brixton, which is closed. There are some traces of screens, so you can see that the top bit in this pub, uh, the Winchester is still there. Uh, the Jackalope still has a sad looking, kind of like a third of a partition sticking out. They probably just felt sorry and just left it there, no other reason. Um, yes. I sometimes go to pubs and point to the staff on the counter where there used to be a partition and now there's an infill. And that's when they look at me and say, are you going to order something? <laughs> okay, but it is interesting. It is interesting to kind of see those traces because the reality is if I don't point them out, no one will and for a very good reason. <laughs> there are a few restorations. Uh, Samuel Smith, the brewery, is renowned for very lavish restorations. Uh, the Bolin Tavern um, has really, I mean, they spent a lot of money uh, restoring all those old partitions. Uh, they look original, but they're fairly new. Uh, they also have a pub in Holborn, the Princess Louise. Okay, so those of you that know it, it's a, it, it's a restoration, but works quite well. Um, the second half that I just want to go through quickly is just to dive into those sections, at least some of them. So the first one is the Saloon Bar. This is the Three Crowns in Stoke Newington, where I live. This is what it looks like today, proper sort of gastropub, right? It's quite nice, you know, quite, uh, quite interesting. This is what the Saloon Bar, this is what it looks like today, used to look like. Whoa, imagine Sunday roast there. I mean, talk about VIP. I mean, this is, this is what a saloon bar looked like. But the interesting thing is, behind the partition, you've got the laborers. You've got the people that are paying less money and are wearing overalls. They just came from the factory and they're playing darts and dominoes. Okay, behind that little timber partition. And you can see the saloon bar in the plan of the pub from 1927. And you see all those partitions and all those entrances and all of them have the big sign people knew where to go. There was no question. You don't think, hmm, darling, should we go to the public bar tonight? Just to get people watching? Okay, you don't do that. Um, there was a very strict dress code in the saloon bar. This is actually more of a recent uh, sign from about kind of the 1990s. But in the saloon bar, it was other uniform or a shirt and a tie. Um, a guy replied on, on Twitter a few days ago and told me that he wasn't allowed in the saloon bar in a pub because he was a biker. So leather jacket was not allowed in the saloon bar. Okay, but you saw the photos. I mean, it was a place that you wanted a very specific type of clientele. These are other photos of some saloon bars. So you kind of get the vibe, you get the sense, right? But this was the amazing thing. Like I said, today pubs, it's a, it's a very single atmosphere, very single interior, very single clientele you're trying to attract. Back in the day, there was room for everyone, but you have to know your place. Uh, this is the Shakespeare, my local in Stoke Newington. This is what it looks like today. This used to be the saloon bar. Mm, a bit kind of maybe not like the three crowns, but you can get a sense, like I said, uh, plants and vegetation was always welcomed. Um, notice the thing on the counter, because this is really important. What if you go to the saloon bar, because you're quite kind of, you know, middle class or um, upper working class and so on, but you don't want to see the people either serving you because they're working class, and worst of all, you don't want to see the people on the other end of the pub because they're really working class. They used to have snob screens. These were glass shutters that were placed on the counter so you could order your drink and then say, bye-bye. <laughs> there are only eight original ones in the country. Okay, very, very rare. This is the Prince Alfred ones in the ladies' bar. God forbid they make eye contact. Okay, but they're very decorative. If you see one of those, take a photo, frame it, send it to me. They're very rare. Um, just a, a few quotes. Before I go to the public bar and I'm running out of time, this is uh, a really interesting quote that someone sent to me. Uh, she said, uh, we went in both the public and the saloon bars. Mostly saloon, but if my dad wanted to play cards, he went in the public bar as cards weren't allowed in the saloon. One of my uncles mainly used the public bar as he was a dart player. 
Women were allowed in both bars by then, that's the 1960s, in the Albert, but workmen were expected to use the public bar. No scruffy boots or overalls in the saloon. My dad's friend George was a bus driver who was allowed in the saloon because he had a uniform. Can you imagine that today? So let's look at the public bar. We saw the saloon, really posh, very kind of uh, lavish and glamorous. Welcome to the public bar. <laughs> okay, now this is the proper boozer. This is a proper public bar, okay? Men only, originally, working class, playing darts, playing dominoes, and so on. This is what it would look like, okay? But, like I said, it was inclusive enough to allow them in. Uh, this is a great book. Just a few quotes from that before I finish. Uh, public bar, the plebeian side of the pub, where everything is cheapest, where nothing is charged for decoration, where pints of ale are the most popular drink, where there are no pin tables and darts, shove a penny, and dominoes are played by people who have played them all their lives. It's a bit sad. Um, these are just a few photos of public bars. Okay, uh, there are many public bars where any patron who is too obviously not dressed as a laborer is regarded with distrust. His presence in, is resented by the patrons as well as by the management on natural grounds that he can afford the saloon bar. Okay, they don't like outsiders. Uh, this was the public bar in the Dr. Johnson. Dart, of course. This was the Cook's Ferry Inn, 1928. Very simple, very utilitarian, nothing fancy, no, uh, like I said, carpets or any furnishings that might get sort of uh, dirty and so on. It's interesting when you compare from a catalog for the same pub, the public bar versus the saloon bar, right? And you can, this is the 1960s, by the way, so things were starting to change, but you can tell by the, you know, the floor, the, 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 the furniture, the chairs and so on, that there was a distinction. And designers that created furniture for pubs actually had in their catalog two types, for the public bar, for the saloon bar. Uh, last one I'm going to quickly go through, the private bar. This was really if you want to go and you know, just read a book. It's somewhere between the saloon and the public, so it wasn't as scruffy as the public, but it wasn't as posh as the saloon. Usually quite small in the pub itself. Interestingly, you can actually see that even the counter itself had a kind of a, a difference, okay, in the actual decoration between the public and the private bar. Okay, just showing you that sometimes there was more than one. These are some private bars from back when, snob screen. Um, and ladies could not go to the public bar, accompanied in the saloon, private bar sometimes. Some pubs had the ladies only, so you can see the ladies bar often referred to as the snug. Okay, there's a very famous scene in Coronation Street, circa 1964-65, someone goes and dies in the snug. Look it up on YouTube. <laughs> and the last thing I say, if you're interested in pub heritage and pub history and you want to learn more about how pubs used to be and the social history of pubs, these are just a number of books that I recommend you get hold of. Some of them are rarer than others, uh, but definitely good read, a lot of photos, plans, and so on. So that was it about the segregated pub. You should feel very lucky that you can walk into any pub today and sit wherever you want, even if some of the doors don't actually work. Thank you very much. Excellent, wonderful. I don't know about you guys, but I've recognized way too many pubs from pictures. Um, and I'm also going to use my privilege as the host to ask the first questions. Go for it. Burning question. Toilets. Segregated, not? So, interestingly, um, originally I heard that uh, the entrance to the loo was through the public bar. So women could not go, obviously. Yeah. Um, but if you look at plans of other pubs, I guess mostly throughout the 20th century, you do have the ladies as well. So there was a movement to improve pubs. They had quite a bad reputation. So they were designed to be more welcoming to women and families as well. So it, it took a bit of time, but they got there eventually. Wonderful. Any questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I sometimes notice that buildings that used to be pubs have like bigger windows. When did they start 
So the question is, pubs or older pub buildings have bigger windows and kind of the transition from like someone's personal house to the actual pub itself. A lot of the pubs you see in London today's were, today were purpose built, usually between sort of the 1840s and 1900s. So those original houses that I showed you were way sort of 200, 300 years ago, uh, usually in the countryside before kind of the urbanization that then you had those purpose built pubs that retained kind of those original rooms. Um, interestingly about windows as well, all pubs used to have curtains and etched glass. Drinking was a very private thing. You wouldn't just want to be kind of seen from inside and waving at people. Um, so today when you look at a pub and there's curtains, usually it's like, I'm not sure I want to go in if they can't see what's going on from the outside. Yes? Um, as like, yeah, somebody who's interested in archaeology, I love that you've gone and seen all the actual spaces. But do you also see like evidence of this in literature, like people talking about their experiences of different pubs and... So the question is about reading and literature about people describing their experiences of going to pubs. That's one of the things that I'm really passionate about. And I think in these books, especially the Back to the Local, it's, it's really good because it was written in 1949. First edition was in the 30s, 1938, I believe, and it really brings to life what those areas used to be like. I always ask on Twitter and Facebook people to describe, if they say, oh, I used to go to so-and-so, why did you go to the saloon? Did your parents go to the public or the private? You don't get much of that, but I'm, I'm definitely trying to document and share some of those kind of memories and stories from people. Yeah. Was there any outdoor space in these pubs? Like, was that segregated as well, or was it just... So was there any outdoor space? I've only seen evidence of outdoor space in the 60s. So I think in, in plans of pubs in the 60s, you start getting sort of outdoor space. I'm not sure if that was an extension of which of those areas, uh, but it came definitely later on. Just off the back of that, um, like the Georgia, in, sorry. That's a huge outdoor space, so how would that space have been so, like, used I don't think outdoor space, I think it's a fairly recent thing. Um, again, like I said, drinking was a private affair. You wouldn't just go to a beer garden outside and just sort of raise a pint. So all the outdoor spacing, I would say, the earliest is probably the 1960s, where the attitudes towards drinking and segregation based on class and gender were changing. So I, I, I haven't seen any evidence of an outdoor space that was an extension of the public or the saloon bar. It was very much part of the house and part of the interior. Do you see the, like, the coach house as being different from the pub? Definitely. I'm not sure I can get into that, but coaching inns were really just for travelers, just stopping, getting the horses kind of refreshed and kind of getting a drink. Beer was healthier than water. I still, still is, really. Um, but the, the coaching inns, taverns, and ale houses evolved into the urban pub that we know today. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Miss Martin. Yeah. Uh, so, how was this enforced? Like, did people like boo people? And you knew your. You, well, it's an interesting question. So the question is, how was this segregation enforced? You, people knew their place, right? You get the look. That's what it was about. If you were dressed like me going into the public bar, you would get the look, and so would you. Okay, so I don't think that it was, it wasn't legally enforced, it was socially enforced, there was a social norm. If you wanted to risk it and just have a drink in the public bar somewhere, you know, go for it. But my, my understanding from talking to people is that the, the landlord or the, the, the regulars would make you very much aware that you're not welcomed. So which would have been more taboo, going from a, like a saloon to a public space or a public to a saloon space? Well, the drinks were cheaper in the public. So if you go to the public and then think, ooh, I'll go to the saloon, it's much comfier, right? You can't get away with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you touched on like internal uh, architectural designs. And I think you, you showed, I mean, there were the, 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 the snob glasses, and then there was something, it just looked very, very rigorous. Um, and the way you presented it, it's, it's like there's, you know, this is how it was and things were all designed. Have you seen the examples where they've gone too far and you think that maybe even in the times when they tried to design it, people, in, even in the times when they designed it, that people thought, hmm, this is going too far? 
So the question is, did people think certain designs went a bit too far? Is that specifically for the partitions and the kind of the screens that created that separation? All of the kind of architectural suggestions, the screens. No, I mean, I, I think, like I said, some of, some of the screens are more decorative and ornate than others. I mean, some of them do go all the way up to the ceiling and they look a bit, a bit naff in some cases, maybe kind of, maybe not as decorative as others. But I think that on balance, people appreciated the coziness of the private bar and the public bar. Um, I, I didn't see anything that suggested that it was an uncomfortable environment because I think pub design, which is a fascinating topic about creating atmosphere and what is that pubness, what is that essence of a pub, you want to make sure that, like I said, people don't feel like they're drinking in a very closed, small space like a prison cell. You need to find that balance. And I think most pubs that succeeded did. Yeah. Um, so, like, you, you talked about this sort of <coughs> ending in the 1960s. Yeah. The change of social attitudes, but like, actually removing all these screens and stuff seems like it's quite an expensive thing. Did, was that an immediate, like, we're going to tear out all the screens, it's the 1960s, or did they just open the doors and it became a bit more porous and then... I mean, it's interesting. So the question is, as far as the 1960s, was it a bit of a, an, an expense to uh, go open plan, effectively? If you think about it, those... Uh, I'm just going to show some of the screens. They weren't really like a, like a stud wall today. It wasn't bricks. It was just a piece of timber that you can just sort of remove and then you just need to kind of have like an infill in the counter. So it could have happened overnight. I mean, it doesn't look, like I said, it's almost symbolic. You know, you're not trying to prevent someone from bashing through it. Um, but I, I, I always sort of, I'm curious about how people that for years went in the pub and it was sort of separated. One day they walk in, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> Where do I go now? <laughs> right, but maybe one day I'll come across someone that can tell me what it was like. That it's almost like sort of post-Brexit thing. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, did you read anything about how race played into this? Like, how, sorry? How race played into it. Like, did it matter more than social class? Or? So the, yeah, so the question is, so when I picked the topic or the, the title for the talk, and I call it the segregated pub, I was very conscious that the word segregation is very loaded, usually associated with racial segregation, but it's also social and gender-based. I did try to research was, was there any racial segregation that was maybe facilitated by the separation? I heard online from one person that claimed that one pub in Dalston, in Hackney, there was in the 70s a racial separation. He said the Irish went to the saloon, the Afro-Caribbean were expected to go to the public bar. That was the only example that I came across. Right, where they actually kind of, they, they use those screens to create that sort of racial segregation. But again, one person, one pub, I haven't seen any evidence that it was more widespread than that. Um, is there something that you're looking for that you haven't found yet when you're... Another snob screen, <laughs> number nine. <laughs> well, there's one on eBay going for like 2,000 pounds, <laughs> original. Yeah, so my birthday's in May, I'm just saying. <laughs> If you want to surprise me with a snob screen. I don't think we can expense that. Too. Yeah, yeah, no. But like I said, um, there's, a, there's an inventory online of all the heritage pubs that have some relics, so partitions and some of the old signage and so on. Um, I created a Google Maps uh, with 183 London pubs that I'd like to visit for the interior, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, it's public. Message me and I can send you the link and you can have a, have a look as well. Let's do three more. Three more, and uh, I'll just go. Yeah. Oh, uh, were there pubs that kind of in the 60s um, hung on till the bitter end and were like, I'm not taking my screens down? Like, what was the, what was the process of, like... So that's something... That, so the question is, what was the process of, OK, from tomorrow, we're taking the screens down. Everyone... Take your screens down. Um, it, wa it was more gradual than that. Uh, so as I said, pubs realized that, first of all, there was an economical incentive because the public bar was a bit cheaper than the saloon bar. So you could probably, you, you could have a single price across the board and you would probably opt for the saloon bar pricing than the cheaper public bar one. You probably knew that people won't accept necessarily by the late 60s having that sort of separation of working class and, and middle class as well. And I think there were also some licensing issues around supervision. So those partition pubs, 
because they're so cozy and snug, people can be up to sort of no good. So I believe in some cases to get a license, the magistrate would either ask you or expect you to demonstrate that your pub is a nice open space and no one will sort of do sort of naughty things in some corner in the snug. So there was also an incentive to demonstrate that in the process. Uh, last two, I believe. Yes. Uh, you were saying there's a difference in the pricing structure. Was that a deliberate attempt at trying to enforce segregation? Or yeah. is it more just a, a sort of business reason to attract more people into the pub that could not maybe afford the more expensive price? So the question is about the pricing structure and how come the public bar is a bit cheaper. So there were two reasons for that. The main one, again, just to kind of, I would say, attract the, the working class and saying, look, it's a bit cheaper on this end of the pub as opposed to the saloon bar where you're paying for the decoration, the entertainment, and so on. Were they encouraging the segregation? It was, just a, it was just society. I mean, it was accepted that the working class drinks in this part of the, the pub. Everyone, let's say, more superior classes have their more lavish area. I know there were also some legislation around um, pricing structures in pubs as well, and you had to have like two areas. If you want to sell spirits, it gets a bit complicated. But it kind of worked for everyone up until the 1960s, more or less. And last one, <coughs> anyone? Are you? It's the same question. It's the same question, OK. <laughs> Shared question. Did they used to sell the same things, same drinks all over the pub, maybe in different sections? Was it different quality? Was it something I haven't different? looked at the menu, but I'm not sure that in the saloon bar, right, you would just down pints. Probably more sophisticated drinks, potentially. Right, so it may have sort of uh, differed slightly, but I don't think it was completely, you know, if you wanted to order beer in the saloon bar, you probably could. You would just pay a bit more for it. Cool. Anyway, um, I'm going to stick around if you have any more questions. Otherwise, feel free to message me with other photos of partitions, snob screens, or any plans of old pubs. Thank you very much.